Welcome to the Afterman Podcast with myself, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall. The Afterman Podcast seeks to illuminate and explore how traders succeed in financial markets by understanding the mindset, behavior, and psychology that underlies great risk-taking performance. to this week's episode of the Alphamon Podcast. Our guest today is one of the world's leading technical analysts, Robin Bieber. Robin has worked in the oil trading industry for almost 40 years, having been a trader, broker and analyst since the early 1980s. In this chat today, we go well beyond a basic discussion on analysis and the basics of technical analysis as well as other forms of analysis in general and explore how to use and apply price action analysis in ways which can add real value to how traders and investors work. This is a great conversation which builds as it unfolds. We did not aim to have a discussion about beyond technical analysis, but that is effectively what it became as it built. We are sure you will benefit from listening to Robin's wisdom and the thoughts this triggered for Mark and myself. Before we start, a quick word about the Alpha Mind podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. The STA are one of the world's leading professional bodies serving the technical analysis and trading communities. We are delighted to announce that as a result of our partnership with the STA, listeners to the Alpha Mind podcast can now receive a £100 or local currency equivalent discount on the cost of their world-beating home study course and the home study course and diploma package, which offers diplomas accredited by CISI, the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investments, which is a global professional body for those who work in the financial and investment profession. The study course is an online replication of the full STA diploma program, which is delivered annually at the London School of Economics. The modules are produced by some of the leading figures from the world of finance and cover a wide range of topics. Now, just to give you a sense of some of the areas covered, it includes the foundational aspects of technical analysis, comparing and contrasting technical analysis to fundamental quantitative analysis. And it also explores the basics of support and resistance, chart patterns, trend lines, Fibonacci targets, and timeframe analysis. Now, that's the sort of thing which you get perhaps on some of the other courses out there, but that is literally just the first of many modules which completes the program. It also looks at a wide range of of different chart types and provides detailed coverage of line charts including relative strength and bar charts, price and volume, equivolume, scaling etc. Now there are modules on a whole range of topics, points and figure charts, candle charts and other Japanese charting techniques, Dow theory and market breadth, moving averages, momentum indicators and oscillators, cycles, the Elliott wave principle, basics of GAN theory, market profile, Ichimoku charts, market psychology, trading plans and money management, managing risk and constructing a quantitative trading system, behavioural finance and report writing as well as many other aspects. There is not a more thorough and professional programme in the world. This is the gold standard and as well as upgrading your knowledge and expertise, this will be a major boost to your resume or CV. Participants in this programme typically include traders, both retail and professional, portfolio and fund managers, investors, analysts, trading system designers, financial journalists, and anyone curious to understand more about price action analysis techniques. Now, to take advantage of this offer, just visit our blog page, alphamindblog.blogspot.com, or Google the Alphamind blog, and on the pages at the top, you will see page for the STA Home Study Course. There, you will get details of how to get the £100 discount. Or email us, info at alphaRcubed.com. That is info at the word alpha, the letter R, and the word cubed.com. Whilst you are there on our blog, you may also want to check out the Alpha Mind Trader Performance Coaching Program. The Trader Performance Coaching Program helps people learn about, understand, and develop their risk capability. The program is based on work we have been delivering to elite traders inside some of the world's leading trading and investment firms over the past decade. The coaching helps people facilitate greater self-awareness that enables them to see themselves from afar in ways they have never experienced before. 
This raised self-awareness helps people to understand at a deeper level how they can improve and then support themselves to make positive mindset shifts and changes which can help them bridge the gap between potential to succeed and actual success itself. Again, if you're keen to know more about this, go to the Trader Performance Coaching Program page on the blog or email us info at alphaRQ.com. Now, on with the podcast. Well, welcome to this week's Alpha Mind podcast, and we're delighted to have Robin Bieber with us. Um, Robin was a director of PVM Oil Associates and managing director of PVM Oil Futures before leaving in May 2017. He was in charge of the company's drive to increase business in both the US and the Far East. He joined the group in 1993 and built its successful futures execution business from there. He also authored, I think more importantly for some of the conversation we're going to have today, the daily PVM technical analysis report and played an active role in PVM's OTC crude broken team, uh, which has been at the forefront of, of its market since 1980. Robin has been involved in oil trading and broking for over 30 years, and after having spent nine years in the British Army with the Royal Green Jackets, he joined EDNF Man in 1982, and there followed spells in Tiger Petroleum, Amerex Petroleum, before Robin founded Bieber Oil Limited, which was acquired by PVM in 1993. Uh, and Robin now runs RB Oil Limited, a consultancy company. So really excited to have Robin with us today. And Robin with us today. I know we're going to talk about lots of different things, but Robin, just um, update us on where you currently are. Well, you, you pretty much covered the history and the current, the current affairs is that... Uh, I run RB Oil, which is a technical analysis consultancy company, and I have a number of oil participants who um, pay for my services, pay for my report and my videos that I send out on a daily basis. I do a few other things as well, but that it, my actual, absolute passion is technical analysis and how important it is to the market, or at least to the market participants. And um, I think it's a, an area that is going from strength to strength. Uh, particularly as markets become disintermediated, and this is a, fact, a feature that we've seen for the last 20 years, although in fairness in oil it's not disintermediated at all. Um, but as the electronic markets get, uh, have a uh, very strong influence um, on the way, when I say electronic markets, the electronic markets are dominated by algorithms, and as a result, uh, one, I think, has to be pretty much aware of technical analysis and what these algorithms are doing. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, they're over 80% of the volume of a market. And with that in mind, it's probably worth understanding what they're trying to do. Indeed. And do you sense in the real world out there that technical analysis has rather become the distant cousin within the research departments and uh, sometimes is not as well supported as, as, it, as it should be? Um, I think you're flattering technical analysis. I don't think it even makes it through the de genealogical front door. Um, I, I mean, to be honest... I don't think technical analysis is highly regarded in the uh, research community. And I think that's misplaced. I mean, we all know Warren Buffett has said, and I believe him absolutely, that he doesn't uh, have any time for technical analysis. But his um, form of investing, which is 20, 30, 40 years and control the company, it doesn't really matter what the share price does in the next week or two or three. I mean, he, he's interested in acquiring the company or a large chunk of it, whereas an awful lot of other people uh, are trading with much less of a huge time frame. And if you're trading for one, two, three months, technical analysis can make a huge amount of difference. And I think it's very dangerous to um, feel, think that it's irrelevant uh, simply because someone as esteemed and as high profile as Warren Buffett says it. It's irrelevant to him because he's trying to acquire a company and it doesn't matter whether it goes down 2 or 3%. He's there for 40 years anyway. You're trying to hedge a cargo of crude oil and there's 20 cents in the profit and you get the hedge wrong. That's your profit gone. Different kettle of fish. It's interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm hearing you talk about Warren Buffett and, and you're right. I think, you know, when I started in the game, getting on for 30, 
five years ago. Technical analysis was considered um, a little bit of, uh, I'm not sure you call it a, a dark art, but something that people outside the mainstream did. And I think it's become a lot more mainstream, but there still has this kind of, there's an intellectual snobbery towards it. And you're right, especially with investors. And I think you're right, that investing is a different game. But when you look at the most successful trader of the past three decades, it's unquestionably Jim Simons. And Jim Simon's models are based off the same principles of technical analysis. You know, if you, if you heard Greg Zuckerman talk about him, and Greg Zuckerman wrote the book about Jim Simons towards the, early, you know, the end of last year, and he was on our podcast in January, it, it was basically taking the formula and the basics of technical analysis and quantifying them and applying them to a model. And he realised that that's where the money is going to be made. You, you raised a, a fascinating point. Um, and that that's an amazing book. Anyone who anyone who actually is thinking about getting into the markets and using technical analysis should frankly read it. Uh, there's not much of a better advert. I can't remember exactly what his average return per annum was since the early 1980s, but I think it was north of 40 percent. I mean, it was exceptional per yeah. annum. I think I think it was 40 plus percent after costs, and their costs and their fees are enormous. So uh, I think pre-cost is possibly north of 60% on, yes. on an yes. enormous amount of money, not on a small amount of money. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. It was a huge sum of money and their costs were the same costs that they started off in, in the early 1980s at 3 and 30. 3% management, 30% performance. No other fund, as far as I am aware, is even close to that in terms of costs. And they've maintained those costs. Yeah. Uh, but the, the point you raised about uh, Jim Simons and, and putting together a team of ex-mathematics and physics PhDs and creating an algorithm that worked in the markets is a fascinating story. And it is based on technical analysis. Uh, and with that in mind, I am, I am surprised still that, and you made this point a few minutes ago, that, with, with, that the technical analysts are not, only not, are not even the poor cousins of the research arena. They, they literally don't eat at the same table of the esteemed fundamental analysis. But fascinatingly, the FD did an analysis recently in the last five years and discovered that less than 95% of all research is even read. Well, you know, that I find very interesting. I'm talking about fundamental research, not technical. Maybe it's the same with technical. I don't know. It's, 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 it's interesting because I, when I was introduced to it in the late 80s, I was kind of, I, I don't get this drawing funny lines on a, in those days it was on a chart which was then glued onto a wall. Um, I, 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 there was something which appealed to me about it. There was something I, I couldn't quite put my finger on, but I didn't get it. And then I moved into trading a little bit more in the 90s and um, someone explained to me that the reason why it works is all to do with psychology, is to do with the, the, the balance of buyers and sellers um, and, and what their minds are thinking about and, so, so, and that people will follow the herd and be too bullish at the top and too bearish at the bottom. And, and technical analysis basically caught that within patterns of behavior which was reflected in prices and how prices behaved and, and then it seemed to make more and more sense and then i saw this dramatically in 1994 when i was on the uh, the rate and bond trading team at uh, a swiss investment bank in london and everyone was bullish bonds as we would say at the time bullish to the yin yangs of bonds and uh, my technical analysis analyst came over to me and she's actually been on the show um, a few uh, about a year ago, Carol Harmer. And she said, um, what is everyone long for? This is just so overbought. It's ridiculous. It's setting itself up for the most dramatic decline that I can recall. And she picked the top and the bottom of the, uh, what was a six month bear market in bonds. That, that absolutely destroyed an awful lot of people in the market. She almost called it to the to the to the point on the chart and to the day, and it, it was incredible. And I was the only one who actually listened to her. 
But even then, the other traders, you know, what happened bizarrely, and you probably, we probably all heard this, was they started blaming the technical analysts for all their money, for all their losses. <laughs> over to you, over to you, over to you, Robin. <laughs> well, it it's one of my favourite sayings that markets look fantastic when they're making new highs and testing resistance. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there in the first place. No one would be buying it if it didn't look fantastic. But it's a technical, and the same is true when the market's plunging to lows. It looks like a crock off, but it wouldn't be there unless it looked dreadful. But then the, the technical analysis kicks in. You look at various different things, and it provides some fantastic warning signals. Those warnings are incredibly dangerous to, to ignore. Incredibly dangerous. And technic technical analysis is really very good at preparing you for market turns. But in essence, trends last longer than ranges. Trends, a market is usually in an uptrend or a downtrend for 80% of its life. Therefore, one of the things to do is to discover or apply studies that keep you on the side of the trend and be prepared to get flat if it looks like it's going to turn direction and never sell an uptrend. Now, that seems simple, but there are other ways of taking advantage of a market as it turns without having to go short. You can buy some security like some puts or things like that. Keep your risk, keep your risk well, well managed and in control, which of course is one of the great failings of a lot of people over trading volume. They can't take a, a five or even or a, fi a five or even 10% cut in price. They, you know, they're too exposed. That's a huge, huge danger that a lot of, prop traders uh, uh, run into. Yeah, certainly from my perspective of the early days of being on the trading floor in London, um, and I adopted it from Chicago, some Chicago locals that were, were there. And, you know, I, I was an artist and not a mathematician. And I thought, this is, this is an interesting way of just tracking price. But what, but what it gave me was the ability to make sense of price and understand just what price meant. But it meant that there was this vibration going on during the day that you could, you could sort of, as you, as you say, get forewarning of a, of a bigger move, get an idea as to where that move might go to, uh, importantly if it's against you, of course, yeah. and actually being able to comment on the market, which is a great, a great gift, you know, to be able to look at something and actually make sense of it and actually talk to people about just what's going on. And I don't think there are many things that can do that, of course, in a very immediate sort of way and be very portable. So you can take this skill and you look at the bond market, but you can take it to oil, you can take it to equities and you can have an opinion. And certainly from a sales perspective, that's important. From a, I guess from a hedge fund perspective, from a trader perspective, to have that flexibility is vital. You don't necessarily have to read the research, you know, because of, you, know, you can see it, you know, if you've got a sense as to what you're reading, you can see what's being analysed and get a sense as to where, you know, that analyst is, you know, from, from just where the lines are. So, I, you know, for anyone that's not doing it, for God's sake, find a place, get to do it, because it will transform the way you in, in the modern form of, of reading the tape, of having your pulse, having your finger on the pulse of the market. Yes, I mean, I think the, the way I would describe it is that now that we're in the 2020s, um, it would be like going on a car journey without a sat nav. I mean, technical analysis is a real guide, it's a real help. On the, on the assumption that you're not investing in an instrument that you don't expect any return from for 25 years, or you don't expect to even look at a game for 25 years, where of course it doesn't really matter the ebb and flow of the market. But for most of us mere mortals, a 5% move in an underlying um, commodity or whatever it happens to be is a pretty big move. And technical analysis provides the guidance. I mean, I, I'm not what I'd call an active investor, but I have a flyer in the stock market from time to time and I have to analyze every morning the oil market. And it would be, my job would be impossible uh, without technical analysis. Absolutely impossible. And keep it simple, no? 
absolutely essential. You know, on my, on my, but you're so right. On, on my computer analysis machine, there are 120 studies. It's a very good machine. I use three of them. In fact, I'm even thinking of designing my own one to just have three of them so traders don't get sidetracked going up technical cul-de-sacs, of which there are many. Now, for, so, it, for some people, a load of studies work very well. But I recall very, very clearly a friend of mine taking up technical analysis. He'd read all the right books, blah, 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 blah. And he got a stack of 16 screens stuck in his flat in London. And each of those screens was quartered. So there were four screens per 16 screens. I mean, I've lost the maths on this, but it's off the Richter scale. And when I went to see him, I couldn't understand how he made a decision because he was looking at too much. Needless to say, those screens got packed up and sent back to the deliverer four months later and he'd lost all his money because he, he, he had too much information. Can I ask you, because a lot of people are listening to this podcast, there. there's a lot of new traders and, and you know, and, and, and obviously I think new traders could be people who've been doing it quite a few years because it takes so many years to learn this. I think it's fair to say you, we're always learning when you do this job. But what, what would be the, uh, as someone who's been in the market so many years, what would be your advice, your three key pieces of advice to people using technical analysis in their trading? Well, by definition, your question assumes, probably correctly, that the people using technical analysis are already in trading roles in companies and not sitting at home and trying to doing it as a small prop trader. So I will adjust my oratory to the audience of the former. In other words, they're in bank they're in trading companies. Well, the first thing that I would do would be to buy JJ Murphy, technical analysis of either the financial or the futures market. I'm not sure what the latest edition is called, as a reference book. I would then find, either within my company or outside my company, a technical analysis analyst rather, who was good, who had at least an 80% track record of getting it right. Incidentally, finding someone who gets it wrong 80% of the time is just as good, but they tend to have a short lifespan. <laughs> but, um, and then I would, I would look at charts and I would really make a friend of or get in touch with someone who really knows what they're talking about, who's external to the company. Because internal to the company, it can be a little bit um, incestuous. Whereas people who, can, who make a living out of technical analysis by being objective, not wedded to a position, and can actually say, well, have you looked at this and have you looked at that, um, can be worth their weight in gold. Form your own opinions. I mean. I must say it didn't take me a long time to form my opinions on why the markets move the way they do, because there's a certain amount of artistry involved in here, and not a, a regimented discipline. The regimented discipline is the discipline of trading. The, the, the art form is choos choosing those um, technical instruments, if you like, studies that influence the market most. And I, as I say, I only look at three, and my advice to any young trader would be look at short-term moving averages, look at stochastics, and look at Fibonacci correction points. You don't need anything else. Right, okay. Anything else in my book is right. I don't look at anything else. Okay. And do you have, I mean, do you look at patterns? Are you a pattern technical analyst or are you a trend technical analyst? Um, I don't look at patterns, um, although I'm, I know what most patterns mean, you know, head and shoulders, flags, pennants, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I use short-term moving averages to keep me on the side of the trend. I use correction points to give me targets, and I use stochastics to be my rev counter, tell me when it's getting overcooked. Stochastics are fantastic uh, um, instrument, uh, uh, studies. They, they tell you when a market's really beginning to get overcooked, but they can be misleading, so everything has to be harmonious. It's no good saying, oh, well, the moving averages are telling me the market's going up, but the stochastics are showing bearish divergence. And actually the Fibonacci boys are saying that it should dip. That's not, that's not great, that's a lack of harmony. You need everything pointing in the same direction. And that's pretty much the case for eight, eight months of every year, if not nine. Okay, and, and what about for, um, you, you talked about a trader in an investment bank. What about for uh, somebody who's, who's doing it for themselves from home? 
what, what would be, I mean, it's a different game, first of all, we, we know that. And obviously there's different, there's people at different levels of experience. There's, there's many who are still at boot camp level. Um, there, there's some who I think have made it to base camp level where, where the possibility of them starting to make money from this is a very real possibility, but they've got to still uh, make that happen. And, and then there's the, the the guys who have been doing it many years who have kind of got past past uh, base camp and are uh, <laughs> ascending the mountain and doing well. And there's there's not many of them to be honest. They're, they're quite rare, and the air's rarefied up there. But to those different groups, or talking to the traders from home, uh, and I'm aware also they are sold. And this is what I believe: they are sold a lot of bad technical analysts analysis. They're sold analysis packages and advice from people that I find that have barely been doing it. Who think they can draw a few lines on the charts and then they're very good at marketing. You know, bless them, they're great marketers and they actually end up making a lot of money out of marketing their service. But I look at some of their output and I, and I wince. Um, and of course, the, the, the young traders aren't particularly aware of this. So what would some of your advice be? First of all, let's go in reverse. Let's take the rarefied group. They, right. need no, they need no advice from me or anyone else. They're rarefied because they're very good at what they do and they've worked out what it takes. The middle group, <clears throat> which is just getting going, um, who are, let's say, they've been around for a bit, they, they probably don't need that much advice. The fact that they've lasted for over a year or two is probably indicative that they're finding their feet. The most difficult group is the first group who are either sitting at home in front of a computer with one of those programs that you've just alluded to and are trying to make head, make shape of the market, try and understand the market. Well, the first thing I think I would do, I would join an arcade where there will always be some very good traders and I would listen and I would watch and I'd trade minimum volume to begin with and only what I could afford to walk away from and it doesn't make any difference. And I would try to learn from these people as much as I possibly could on why the market does this or that or the other. Because people like to talk about what they're doing, generally speaking, particularly in our case. Um, and that's probably a, a one to two year apprenticeship. Um, I would find, failing that, I would find someone who really knows what they're talking about to guide me because just reading JJ Murphy isn't going to turn you into a brilliant trader. It may, might turn you into a, a, a half good technical analyst. It could turn you into that. Um, but you know, JJ Murphy has 80, 90 studies. That's a lot of studies to sift through. Um, failing that I would get in contact with someone like myself and say, and I think there are people like me dotted around the city or outside who are regarded as being reasonably knowledgeable about what they do and pick my brains as long as one can or other people's brains for as long as you can without spending a lot of money on it. Um, the, the, best, the best way to learn is sitting with people who really know what they're doing. Now, I didn't have that luck. I had to teach myself. As I think I mentioned to you once before, I lost a great deal of money trading in the 1980s and took a three-month off to learn technical analysis because I thought that that's got to be better than mis misunderstanding a fundamental picture. Yeah, you made a really good point about this in the 80s. And, and you know, Mark, Mark's got the same story, I think, and I've got the same story, that it was all starting then and there was no one to show us the ropes. Mm -hmm. and, and when I joined the bank that I joined, the, uh, the oldest trader was in his late 20s, other than the senior head of, you know, treasurer, who used to walk in at nine and leave at three thirty every day, uh, and one of the old-fashioned types. Um, and, and he used to say to us, "I mean, that's how I first got started, really." He said, "Steve, we've got these newfangled things called derivatives. I'm damned if I know what they do. Can you have a look at them and see if you can make sense of them? And if you can, you can trade them." And that was it. And I called up a couple of brokers who said, "You know, obviously they're trying to push these products. You know, can you talk me through them?" Uh, and of course, they were very happy to because they were going to talk me through them in a way where they could sell as many of them to me as possible. And, and that was how it started. And there was no one, again, showing me those ropes. And we kind of had to make it up as we went along 
Um, I, I, I have no no idea whether I made or lost a lot of money in those days, really, because we were just keeping them. We were almost keeping score by pencil. Well, you know, it's well worth looking at the history of the man group to get right. an idea of how everything has changed. When I joined the man group from the army, they were a massive sugar trader. And then they traded all other physical commodities. They had a futures organization. And they had a little fund management team. Um, I can't remember what it was called. I think it was called Mint or something like that. The, the man group itself was worth an absolute fortune. But within a short period of time, the true value of the man group, what it had really uh, made its share price scream and, and be a really valuable organization was its fund management area which of course now is the you know it is morphed into one of the biggest fund managers in the world and that that when i joined was a couple of people with an abacus within 10 years that that was your jim simon's lookalike well i, th I think the, the, the traders who got it quicker than anyone else went on to become the legends of of the hedge fund world. I mean, you know, Paul Tudor Jones was one of those guys, you know, it, it kind of in the land, land of the blind, the one-eyed men were king. And it's great reading their stories when they started out because they all had failures as well. They all had blow-ups. Uh, and, you know, um, Ray Dalio had a spectacular blow-up at the beginning of his career that almost um, killed them before they even commenced. Uh, and I think nearly everyone has that story somewhere and you learn from that. Well, you do. I mean, I've always been a great believer in, I can't remember who, who said, maybe it was Bismarck, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'd, I'd rather learn by other people's mistakes than my own. We will return shortly to the podcast. Just a quick reminder about the Alphamine podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts. The STL are the world's leading professional body serving the technical analysis and training communities. We are delighted to announce as a result of our partnership with the STA, listeners to the Alphamine podcast can receive an exclusive £100 or local currency equivalent discount on the cost of their world-beating STA home study course. To take advantage of this offer, just visit our blog page, alphamineblog.blogspot.com, and on the pages at the top, you will see a link to the STA home study course. Details of how to get the £100 discount are contained within that page. Now back to the podcast. Mark, you're looking, you're looking over there like you've got a question to ask. I'm just reminiscing back to the 80s <laughs> and thinking about all these things where, yeah, you, you, learned, you learned it because you sort of had to and there was nobody around to teach you these things, but you had a, to, a tact, to tactical advantage if you bothered to actually put the work in to, you know, to learn the, the, these tools, this craft. Um, and it did me good. It gave you, gave you an edge, really, um, particularly when there weren't many other people doing it. And, um, you know, it gave, it gave me a route to sort of, you know, expand a role on a broken desk and sort of put things out on Reuters and be sort of benchmark commentator for some of the early stuff on life. And I didn't have any training, frankly. I just picked it up as I went along. But it's easy to pick up if you can be bothered to do it. And it's absolutely vital if you're in markets, if you ask me. Um, as, as, as Robin said, the fundamental stuff, tends to be put out is pretty heavy it, it often isn't read and i can totally understand that um and yet technicals it's it's sort of picture driven and i think having your finger on that pulse of the market in such a clear way i don't think you can afford not to the the, the other side of it is is it's part of the dashboard it, it's not just um some way of finding value but it it, it for me, when I was a trader, it was always um, where the red lines were. You know, you, you, it's a check on your exuberance sometimes. You know, so, so when it went through, I, I, I choose my stop level, my risk level, based on technical analysis. Even if my view was fundamental, you know, I, I'd look at, you know, if it goes below this correction level or it goes below this Fibonacci re retracement, then, then to me, it's probably the I shouldn't be in it anymore. So, and and that it was two things that did. One is it would help me set some my size, my position size, 
because I knew where I was going to be getting out even before I started. I had a good sense of it. And I knew how far I could run it. And if I chose too much risk based on how far I could run it, my risk size was going to dictate to me my trading action, which is never good. And if I knew how far I could leave it based off technical levels, that could help me set a size which would enable me to keep with the trade. So, so in one sense, it was a, a proactive risk management tool. And in the other way, it was a defensive risk management tool. And I think a lot of people forget that side of it as well. Because if you do it fundamentally, quite often you, you, you don't know where you're exiting or where you're taking profit. And I, I see this with an awful lot of people who are fundamentalists who get the direction right, but they don't have a place of where to add, where to take profit, where to get out. Uh, and they, they give it all back just all too often. Well, of course, one of the things I think you mentioned when we spoke sometime recently was you talked about how fundamentals and technicals worked best together. And you are 100% correct. Now, I am not exposed to much fundamental analysis any longer. And when I was, I didn't read much of it, to be honest, because I didn't find it overly useful. Um, but when the, when the fundamentals are kicking in, and you, you read you know, Reuters or Bloomberg, and you see bullish stories, um, and then you look at the charts, and let's just say the charts confirm the bullish stories, then you've got fundamentals and technicals on general information available to everyone pointing in the same direction. When they don't point in the same direction, then you've got a bit of a problem because there's a lack of harmony. And harmony is critically important to maintaining a position. For example, if we take 2009, I think it was 2008, when oil went to $147.50, there was some significant lacks of harmony in the market. We were told by Hank Poulsen that the price was so high because of demand. Yet the market was in contango. The front end of the Brent and WTI curve were trading at a discount, which almost never happens if there's demand. If there's demand, the front goes stronger than the back. And there were a lot of other reasons for feeling that that move to 147.50 was going to end in tears, and it did. And actually, it was technical analysis, uh, long-term technical analysis, that predicted the highs to within about 30 cents on a 10-year on a 10-year chart. In other words, looking at a monthly chart that went back 10 years, you could see how the market was performing, and that's why up at around 147.50, the market looked looked really overcooked and that it would tumble. Technical analysis comes in many shapes, sizes, and forms. Weekly and monthly charts can be immensely valuable. Not many people look at them. Yeah, yeah, and I, and, and I agree with you there. And, you know, quite often some of my best trades were harmonizing fundamental and technical analysis, but not always in the way you described, in that they're telling the same story, but actually where... Uh, there is a fundamental story that's driving the market. And then you've got some resistance from the tentacles are looking the other way. And then I'm noticing the market is not following through on some fundamental news stories or fundamental data. And you're starting to think this is feeling heavy because that news story should be giving a bid to the market. And it's not. And then you're looking at the technicals, which are starting to tell you uh, something else is happening. And not only is there resistance there, there's potential for a big correction forming. And, and then it, it, it's that to do. So it's kind of like you, you do have a harmony, but you have a story that's not being confirmed, a fundamental story that's not being confirmed by the price action. And then you've got a technical story, which is telling you something else. And, and so often in my past, the technical story won. Not only did it win, just as importantly, it gave the early warning signal. Yes. Techn technicals will almost always um, come through the door before the fundamentals. 
In other words, the technicals will be telling you. And in the situation that you've just described, which is a very heavy toppy market, you'll have the stochastic flipping around going negative, you'll have some bearish divergence, and basically everyone who could buy it has bought it, and it's very, very vulnerable. In other words, everyone's feeding off the same story, which actually the tide's gone out, and that story isn't wearing swimming trunks. You know, there's a great, I'm thinking of, you know, as people are listening to this, they're probably not aware, but your wife is our guest on the show, the next podcast oh. afterwards, Tara, Tara Svart. Who's, oh, I recognize the name. You recognize the name, yes. Yes, if anyone's read the source, and I highly recommend them to read it, it's a brilliant book. And we'll be talking about that in our next podcast. And some of my hedge fund clients are reading it now. I've recommended it to them. Um, Tara is Robin's wife and I know where they met and how they met because I've I've listened to the book <laughs> you're the first guest who I know that but um, it, we've already done that podcast with Tara and she talks about something in neuroscience where you feel something before you're consciously aware of it you've already got those it, it's your, your neurochemicals are picking up on it you're sensing it but it hasn't reached conscious awareness in your mind and i think there's something similar with technical analysis where the technicals are often indicating something that's not consciously out there in the market yet but it will be out there soon and that's reflected in the price action the, the momentum um that general feel of the way price uh, you know the volatility is changing the volatility patterns and, and, and I think that's fascinating. And I think, you know, there is, a, there is a, almost a collective. The, the market is a collective and had its own collective, uh, almost neurochemicals running, running through it. You are 100% correct. And it just goes back to the point I made no more than 30 seconds ago, um, which is the technicals precede the fundamentals with signals. And that is very much what you're saying and but you've got to look at the technicals to spot the signals and it, it frankly isn't um it isn't that complicated it really isn't i mean if the market is failing to go up on another piece of bullish news it sort of isn't a bad indicator that the probably the market is sated with length and that there's a nasty correction due. you can't technically analyze maximum pain but the market, by definition, will cause the most amount of pain to the most amount of people most of the time. If it was easy, every man and his dog would be doing it, which is why when you spoke earlier about people up in at ethereal levels who've gone through all the stages and make millions a year trading, there are very few of those. Yes, yeah. That, 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 that they are in the less than 1%, I think. Oh, 100% of that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, no question. Yeah, go on, Mark. Yeah, I think this is uh, an interesting story about you know things turning and you sort of being subconsciously aware. But actually, I found that having an awareness across the curve, for example, and not just paying attention to a front month, but being aware of what back months were doing and analysing them and. Um, as, as much as liquidity allowed, also gave you a significant edge and playing curves became something that um, almost became more efficient than playing outrights. And certainly if you've got a, um, an appetite to not have so much risk on the table, um, you know, tra trading curves are something that aren't necessarily taught to the, the man at home trading outrights. We're actually start being slightly more creative and looking in places where the herd isn't looking can provide you with some very interesting ideas. Well, you make a really interesting point there. And it's something I look at hugely, which is, um, I call it deck red deck. So deck Brent against the deck 20 Brent against deck 21 Brent. And those spreads move with the flat price. But if those spreads are failing to follow the flat price in one direction. Say, for example, the market's going up on flat price and deck red deck is faltering. That's a sign that something's wrong. It's not conclusive, but if you can't get deck red deck to perform with the flat price, it's telling you something. 
and that is probably that the the structure is not going to allow the move to move higher to uh, last today or tomorrow it may come back and that's what we've seen a lot of in the crude oil markets trading the back end spreads as synthetic longs or synthetic shorts i call them poor man's longs and poor man's shorts because they're frankly they require a lot less money to trade um, but and the risk is less but they're very good and they chart beautifully why because the alg algorithms have got involved in trading those back end and front end spreads uh, over the last five to eight years dramatically i mean if you if i bit showed you a chart chart of deck red deck brent and a chart of outright brent say october brent now they would be following um, a, a pattern together and they'd move together and you wouldn't know that the deck red deck wasn't an outright Right. I mean, it's, it's really interesting because something occurred to me as you were talking there, uh, Mark, about what you said and what we were talking about just before that with early signals. Um, as a broker, I mean, I, I, I was a trader, so I was kind of an end user. As a broker, you used to see the order flow. And sometimes were there times where you saw the order flow that was telling you something and the technical analysis was telling you something but it wasn't visible to me as a trader in the market yet. Yeah you, yeah, you got a sense that there was something building, that some folk were looking at the correct way of looking at a market. And I say that because I've seen so many traders that I've called professional, that when you go up to their Bloomberg and see what they've, they've drawn on a chart, you have a fit. Um, and when they get to talk about what they think they're seeing, you have an even bigger fit. And you start to understand that the majority of people haven't bothered to create a, a, a base of understanding about how to analyze the market appropriately. And are getting dragged off in all sorts of different directions that basically lead to them losing money. Um, but those that were smart, I mean, I think from your question, you did get a sense that they were, they were ahead of the game uh, and that they were ahead of the flow that was yet to come. You know, so the, the, there was clearly an advantage by, you know, spending time analyzing appropriately. And, and I think as Robin has said, keeping things relatively simple. One of the, the greatest crude traders that I ever knew just had a daily bar chart. That was it. He didn't even bother with any RSIs or stochastics. He just had a basic bar chart and he probably traded more crude than anybody and got it more right often than most. So there is this philosophy of learning how to do it and learning how to do it correctly, which I think is quite rare, rarer than you think in the professional end of the world, um, and, and, and learning to apply it and apply it broadly. You know, the sense of trading the curve, it's not just where the you know, where spot is or where, where, where the, the front month is. Just be slightly wiser and start looking over there because the opportunities, even though they may be slightly more difficult to get to, the opportunity tends to be at the edges rather than mm. where, where everyone is. And, and what, what I'm hearing from you and from Robin there um, is that there is a lot of information that comes out from the market and the market is talking to you. And it's talking to you in a language called technical analysis. But if you don't understand that language and you can't pick up on it and you can't read it properly, you're missing out an awful lot of information that is really crucial to your chances of success. There's another way of looking at it, and I agree with what you both said. A futures market, the high, low and close of every day is the culmination of worldwide interest and activity. The close is the close, the high is the high. There's no fudge factor like, shall we say, some form of esoteric fundamental analysis. This is very much in your face. You've got a high, you've got a low, you've got a close, and you've got that every day. And that information is actually invaluable in the right hands. It goes to making up a trend where in a trend, the odds are you will have higher numbers each day if it's an uptrend. That information is there to be used. And it does not come as a surprise to me that data sales, for example, is a huge growth area in the interdealer broker and banking sector. Huge 
growth area. Everyone wants data. Why do they want data? So they can plug it into their machines and make some sense of it. And that's Jim Simons and his group doing that. It's not just futures markets, it's OTC, over-the-counter data for crude and product swaps. Because everyone is trying to, not everyone, there are a number of people who need that data, not just so that they can balance their books at the end of the day. It's vital. Listen, I'm, I'm really conscious of the time and we've got to start wrapping up. Um, any, any, how can people find out about you, Robin? They can get onto my website, which is RB Oil, RB Oil, um, or they can email me, which is RB at RBOil.co.uk, or they can get in touch with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll be, we'll be plugging this obviously on our various social media sites, and we'll, we'll put your contact details on the, uh, the episode web page as well. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. And anything, Mark, you want to add before we uh, start to wrap up? Well, I should start to wrap up anyway for, for, from that, really. I think, okay. uh, I think what we've learned is that, you know, from, from Robin's, uh, you know, lifetime of, of just observing market and analysing market is that we do need to pay attention to, to, to the educational side about technical analysis, to, to learn appropriately. And I totally agree that JJ Murphy is 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 a, is, a, is a great read, but also understanding the big stories that are out there. I mean, the the podcast with uh, Greg Zuckerman and uh, the, on the subject of Jim Simons is something that we'd certainly urge people to re-listen to as part of this journey. I mean, ultimately, if you want to make sense, and we talk about sense making and what we do, Steve, you want to make sense of the market, you've got to have a way of of just interpreting these movements that are in the front, that are in the back, that in the in between, that can be where the opportunity is, and ultimately, it's about having a process that is relatively simple. You know, keeping it simple, as we've learned from Robin. You know, moving averages, stochastics, Fibonacci, plus your standard bar chart is pretty much all you need to be effective. For, for, from his perspective, and I would totally agree with that. Venturing off into these other things. I think guess gets people lost um, with too many inputs to, to deal with. And by God, we've got enough of those to deal with in, in real life. So, I mean, Robin, once again, th- thank you so much for, for taking this as a stage further than a, a normal conversation into the world of, the, of obviously t- crude trading from your perspective, but these, these things can be applied to, to all liquid markets that are out there. So we're really grateful for your time and, and uh, Show, showing up for what is, I think, a very, very meaningful chat today. Thank you both. Thank you for listening today. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you have been enjoying the Alphamont podcast series, we would be delighted if you could rate and review the show on iTunes or whichever podcast service you use. Ratings and reviews help us grow our audience, which in turn enables us to keep bringing you outstanding guests for your education and pleasure. Also, be sure to subscribe or follow the Alpha Mind podcast on whichever podcast service you use, so as to make sure you do not miss future episodes. Thank you to our podcast partner, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. You can learn more about their service, becoming a member, and their outstanding technical analysis home study course on the STA website, sta-uk.org. Alpha Mind is a joint collaboration between Mark Randall and myself, Stephen Goldstein. To know more about us, visit our website, alpha-mind.net or go to the AlphaMind blog, alphamindblog.blogspot.com. There you can subscribe to our new newsletter. You can also follow us on social media. My Twitter handle is at AlphaMind101 and Mark's Twitter handle is at AlphaMind102. Or connect with us on LinkedIn and join our AlphaMind LinkedIn group. Thank you once again for listening and we hope you have a great week.